Hey everyone, welcome to the Equine Green webinar on the Black Male Achievement Fellowship. My name is Decker Gongang. I manage the Black Male Achievement portfolio here at Equine Green, and I am glad to speak, you to speak to you today. Now I want to introduce you to our presenters that will be on the webinar today. You heard from Nate earlier. Nate is a senior associate here at Equine Green. Um, also on the line is Sean Dove. He's a campaign manager, the campaign manager at the Open Society Foundation's Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And you are graced with the presence of a 2012 Black Male Achievement Fellow, Donnell Baird of Black Power. I want to first give you an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll spend um, a couple of minutes talking about um, the fellowship. We'll hear from Sean Dove, who will tell you about the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And then we'll also hear from Donnell Baird, who will tell you, take some questions from uh, that you've submitted beforehand, and we'll talk also with Sean about uh, the campaign. We'll also have an ask a quest, ask a question feature on the side of your, your screens. Please only submit questions that you have for Sean and Danelle. If you have any other questions about the fellowship um, concerning eligibility, you can direct them via email to Mary Beth at marybeth at echoinggreen.org. That is M-A-R-Y-B-E-T-H at echoinggreen.org. That email address will be on the screen later during this webinar. Also, if you have to leave early or you miss something, we want to mention that this webinar will be available to watch again um, in our Ask uh, Application Guidance page. You'll see YouTube videos of all of the webinars that we provided for ap application guidance. All right. At Equine Green, we fund early stage social innovators. These are a few examples of our fellow <coughs> of our fellows and alumni. Marquise Taylor, Black Male Achievement Fellow, and his organization, Coaching for Change. Based on his own experiences competing as an athlete, working in the corporate world, and teaching, Marquise has taken a holistic approach to impacting the lives of young people faced with barriers. Coaching for Change uses a cross-age mentoring approach where kids are teaching and coaching other kids. They recruit and train college, train college students to teach and mentor high school students to develop their sports coaching skills. They together create, market, and coach sports programs. Another Black Male Achievement Fellow, Khalil Fuller and his project MBA Math Hoops. Khalil's passion and drive for positive change in education developed while he was growing up in Los Angeles, where he witnessed his best friends becoming disengaged from school, especially from math. So he developed MBA Math Hoops, a supplemental math curriculum for middle school students centered around the ba a basketball board game. By making math relevant and relatable, MBA Math Hoops hopes to improve math scores and instill a love of education in the hearts of youth across the country. And then here's Cole in the center. Wood Brown Boy Project. A graduate of Mills College, Cole worked across the United States on issues of leadership and community economic development before founding Brown Boy Project. Brown Boy builds the self-sufficiency of young queer, straight, and transgender people of color to shape a radical new vision of masculinity. Here at Echo and Green and with the Open Society Foundation's partnership, we are looking for powerful and passionate individuals who are capable of carrying out their ideas for social change. They come to us in a variety of stages of their plans but have a concrete idea of their goal and how to accomplish it. It's more about you as a state of the world changer, state of the world changer, and we're willing to take a chance on your mission. So a little bit about the Black Male Achievement Fellowship experience. The fellowship is an 18-month program that offers the following. Unrestricted social investment of $70,000 over the 18 months of fellow, 18 month fellowship. Applicants must be the founders and the primary decision maker of the organization and they must commit to working, on at the, working at the organization full time, which is for us a minimum of 35 hours per week for the duration of the fellowship. We provide a health insurance reimbursement up to $4,000 a year during the course of your fellowship. Professional development stipend, $1,000 a year. That isn't used for program or your salary, but it goes towards a personal development, personal professional development opportunity for the leaders of your organization. Access to conferences. All fellows are required to attend Echoing Green conferences throughout the program. Right now, there are three designed to provide tips and guidance on leadership and organizational development. Of note as well, with the Black Male Achievement Fellowship, there are several convenings that are put together by our partner, Open Society Foundations, which are also recommended for the fellows. Access to technical support, pro bono partnerships to help your organization progress. From social media to board governance or staffing, Echoing Green provides assistance with any and all small issues fellows may need. If Echoing Green staff can't help a fellow directly, we connect fellows with those who can provide that assistance. 
access to a community of like-minded social entrepreneurs and public service leaders through Echoing Green and Open Society Foundations Network. We understand that being a social entrepreneur can be a lonely process, so fellows really appreciate the chance to connect with others in their similar position. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take over from Decker here and talk a little bit about the evaluation criteria. My name is Nate Madsen. I work on the fellowship and alumni team here. Um, so when we're looking at applications for the BMA fellows and we're evaluating um, whether this application is a fit or not, we look at eight criteria. Um, and four of those are on the individual side of things and four are on the organization or the idea side of things. So let's start with the individual. Uh, one of the first and most important things we're looking for is a sense of your passion and your purpose. Um, so you want, we want you to show us that you care deeply about this issue in this community and that helping black men and boys really is uh, one of the most important things to you and it's what drives you as a person and keeps you motivated in your work. So in the application, we want to hear about the experiences that compelled you to do this work. And we want you to give us a sense of why the work excites you and what it is that keeps you motivated every day. Um, next, we want to hear about your resilience. Um, social entrepreneurship is tough, and it's inevitable. You're going to face a lot of obstacles along the way. And so we want to hear in the application, um, we want to hear you demonstrate how you've been able to bounce back from things in your life, whether it's in your personal life or your professional life. We want to know you have that capacity. Um, also, another thing worth talking about here is the showing us that you have the ability not only to back, bounce back from challenges, but to anticipate challenges in the future and uh, hopefully avoid them. We, leadership is the next of the four individual criteria. Uh, we're really looking for field builders here. And you're the CEO of something that's big and important. And so we want you to show us how you're going to lead this big, important organization to meet its goals. Um, so here we want to hear about those skills, those experiences that are going to help you succeed as the leader of this big and important idea or organization. Um, we want to know that you're someone who's constantly learning, reinventing, and exploring new things. So we want to hear... Uh, also here in leadership, an important thing to highlight in your application is experience with the population that you're going to be working with. We want to know that you can lead within this community. Uh, and then lastly here, uh, the ability to attract resources. And so we think about this as the ability to enlist others in your cause and get them to care about the issue that you care about uh, just as much as you do. Um, so here, you know, we want to hear about examples of how you've been able to attract others to causes in the past. Sometimes that might be, you know, attracting money. It might be attracting um, people to volunteer with you or work alongside of you, any number of resources. And we recognize that leaders, sometimes they can be the charismatic person that's out there uh, in front of 10,000 people at a rally. But other times, um, you know, there's other forms of leadership that are a little bit more unassuming but are still able to attract those resources. So even if you're not the person who's always been up in front, we want to hear about how you get people to work alongside you on the things you care about. So moving on to the organizational criteria, we have four here. Uh, the first is innovation. Um, we want to know, has this been tried in this way before? Um, so it's very important to us to be spotlighting new approaches to supporting black men and boys. Um, and so we want you to lay out as clearly as possible, how is your idea different from what's been tried before? How is it better? Um, importance, so we want to know that the specific issue that you've decided to tackle within this field of supporting black men and boys is one that's um, very important in the world and is going to have a direct impact on a lot of lives. Um, the next criteria here is uh, the potential for big, bold impact, and that goes sort of hand in hand with importance. So we're looking for people who are going to be system changers and really have a big vision for the impact that they can have. And this might happen in a couple different ways. You might be envisioning an organization that starts really small 
but eventually, you know, over the course of many years, grows to serve a huge number of people. But alternatively, you might be envisioning an organization that sort of always stays small, but has such an innovative idea um, that it serves as an example for other organizations and it changes the way things are done. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you already need to be a huge organization or that you even ever plan on being a huge organization. There's many different routes to having that big, bold impact. And then lastly, we're looking for a good business model. And so here, we don't need a fully fleshed out business plan where you have every single thing figured out. Um, we just want to know that you've been thoughtful and um, you're approaching it in a well-reasoned way. So we want to get a sense of what your budget is, what your timeline is, what your staffing needs are going to be, um, and show us those in a way that um, if you don't have everything figured out today, that's okay, but show us that you've really put some time and effort into thinking what might that look like. Um, and then it's worth uh, pointing out that there are a few areas that we're not able to fund. Um, we don't fund scholarships for people who need to obtain a degree. Um, we don't fund organizations that only perform research and have no programs in place beyond research. Research can be a component, but not the only piece of your organization. Um, we don't uh, fund organizations that promote a specific religion and denomination, so those faith-based organizations that are really about promotion of a religion or denomination, we can't fund those. And then lastly, organizations that exist solely for lobbying. You can have a lobbying arm, but it can't be the primary function of your organization. So those are the eight criteria. If you have more questions about those, we have a little bit additional information on our website. There's a video on the criteria, as well as I'd encourage you to look at the application guidance document on the Echoing Green website application guidance page. There's a whole application guide that walks through question by question what we're looking for and how it relates to these eight criteria. So now I'm going to pass it over to Sean. Sean Dove is the campaign manager for the Campaign for Black Male Achievement at the Open Societies Foundation. Uh, Sean has over two decades of leadership experience as a youth development professional, community builder, and advocate for children and families, designing and leading initiatives locally and nationally. And Sean is going to tell us a little bit more about CBMA. Great. Thanks, Nate. And um, thank you, Decker, and the rest of the Echoing team, uh, Echoing Green team leadership. And I uh, just want to welcome all the participants to uh, the webinar. Uh, we are really excited uh, just about the response and, and, and uh, uh, feedback we've gotten with the launch of the uh, Black Male Achievement Fellowship. And so, uh, as Nate said, I'm with the Campaign for Black Male Achievement at the Open Society Foundations, and I'm one of a team of uh, uh, six uh, here. And, um, you know, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement was launched in, uh, at the Foundation uh, in June 2008 to uh, address the economic, political, social, educational exclusion of black men and boys from the American uh, mainstream. But I think it's uh, really important to talk a little bit about the genesis of, of the campaign and, and, and how it was able to bloom here at, at the foundation. And some people on this uh, webinar may recall a 2006 New York Times cover story that proclaimed the plight of black men deepens. And in this article, front page of the Times uh, highlighted uh, data and disparities uh, that really uh, depicted that black men and boys were being left behind uh, in American society uh, when it came to education, mass incarceration, health disparities. And for many of us working in the uh, African American community, uh, this was not news to us. It was not uh, front page news. Uh, 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 we were living this. Uh, working with uh, communities and individuals trying to respond uh, to some of these challenges. And for some of us, uh, it was us, our fathers, our family, so it wasn't new. But what it did, this article uh, here at the Open Society Foundations, was ignite a, an internal uh, conversation. And the narrative was if Open Society uh, foundations uh, which has the values of uh, promoting a democratic 
just fair society. Um, why weren't we at the front of this uh, issue in the philanthropic uh, community? And some of the debate here was that, uh, well, we are uh, supporting black men and boys. Look at our uh, criminal justice uh, fund, and we're uh, investing $15 million a year in, in, in criminal justice. And when you look at mass incarceration, uh, and, and that's mostly black people, black men. And that was uh, one side of the coin. And while that uh, work is really important, uh, we had folks uh, here in the foundation that said, look, here's an opportunity to invest in the front end of the prison pipeline and to build on the assets of black men and boys. So we're really excited and, 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 and grateful that the board and our chairman, George Soros, saw fit to launch the campaign for black male achievement in uh, 2008. And um, a couple of principles and guiding lights about the campaign. I think I just mentioned one thing. It's about building on the assets of uh, black men and boys and that there is nothing wrong with uh, black men and boys. It is indeed the society and the environment in which they are uh, growing up. That's one thing. Number two is that our strategy, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but our strategy, the narrow uh, angle lens, point of departure angle lens, is uh, certainly a focus on black men and boys, but the wide angle lens uh, is really inclusive of of a, a wider community building strategy, which is, uh, includes women, uh, uh, the uh, L LGBTQ community, and that it's really a community building strategy. And so uh, a strategy entails uh, basically uh, three goals, and those three buckets are one, educational equity, two, strength, uh, uh, strengthen low-income black families, um, um, and strengthening family structures, and three, um, expand and ensure 21st century uh, family work opportunities. And so those three buckets of education, work, and family are lifted up by a, a pillar of what we call strengthening the field. And there are three strands to the strengthening the field. And uh, it's one, uh, uh, really building um, the brand, like we like to say, of black male achievement and investing in strategic communications, arts and culture, uh, to really reframe uh, and re-message how black men and boys are presented uh, in, in, in the media, and also in investing in opportunities to provide uh, black men and boys to be masters of their own media. Um, the second strand is really being a catalyst in the field of philanthropy and how do we leverage additional public and, and, and private dollars. Uh, when we launched the campaign, um, I thought that uh, $3 million or $5 million a year uh, was a decent amount uh, of our grant making budget, but quickly found out that the demand really exceeded the supply and so we really had to partner with uh, other foundations and, 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 and public institutions to leverage uh, additional uh, dollars. And the third strand was really to uh, invest in uh, capacity building, leadership development, and sustaining uh, uh, the field of black male achievement. And so about 18 months into uh, the campaign's uh, uh, life, uh, we presented at a board meeting on our strategy, and the board uh, decided uh, that they were going to scale up the campaign and took off the, the term limits. Uh, we were originally supposed to be a three-year initiative, uh, and those term limits were, were taken off, and our budget was literally uh, tripled. And we were challenged to come up with ideas of a scale-up plan. And we came up with a number of things. Uh, one was to really increase our uh, uh, investments around strategic communications, uh, increase our investments in partnerships with leverage and federal dollars for this work. Uh, we invested in and just recently launched a Leadership and Sustainability Institute. And uh, one of the core uh, components of our scale-up plan was launching a fellowship for black male achievement. And uh, Rashid Shabazz, who uh, was a program officer here, was charged with um, leading that effort. And we researched a number of uh, potential partners. We researched and thought about uh, doing it in-house because the foundation uh, has a history 
of, an, uh, of fellowships. Uh, but we wanted to get this to the marketplace, so to speak, uh, very quickly. And when we investigated and met with the leadership of Echo and Green, we, we, we found the right uh, uh, partner. And, and so we launched last year. Uh, and it's really uh, an innovation uh, at what I call an innovation at the verge of two cultures between the Open Society Foundation and Equine Green to bring together this golden opportunity. And uh, once this uh, model was launched, I personally was uh, interested in uh, applying myself because what fellows get, they get the best of the uh, Equine Green community and their 25, 26 year history of social entrepreneurial uh, investments and, and supporting our leaders, as well as the Open Society Foundation campaign for uh, 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 black male achievement. And so we're really excited about this uh, uh, second class that we are about to uh, launch. Um, the fellowship is part of some of our core initiatives, and many of you on the webinar may be familiar with the uh, New York City Young Men's Initiative, where uh, the campaign and the Open Society Foundation partner with Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, to launch a comprehensive citywide uh, initiative here in New York City. Um, the Leadership and Sustainability Inici uh, Institute, which I uh, mentioned, um, and also uh, a partnership with the Knight Foundation, uh, the Black Male Engagement uh, 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 Community that um, has, is actually in their second year as well. And so just in closing, a, a few things I want to say before we are able to, uh, I pass it on to one of our fellows. Um, where we are in the campaign in the last four years, uh, we really build on some of the previous work that foundations like the Ford Foundation and 21st Century Foundation uh, uh, did before the launch of the campaign. We've done a lot of work crafting our investment narrative. And moving on, it's really about, and I want you to really think about this as you are doing your applications, uh, crafting our impact narrative and uh, what are the outcomes and what, are, what is the impact of of this work. Um, one of the things that we've realized is that um, we cannot address this issue with a grant making cycle. This is a generational challenge and that um, America really doesn't need a campaign for black male achievement. We need something more like a corporation for black male uh, uh, achievement, uh, an endowed uh, philanthropic social enterprise that will invest in this work over the long haul. And so that's why we're really excited about this uh, partnership and bringing in new ideas, new leaders, new innovations uh, for, uh, uh, for this work. And so I think the, the, the question is, you know, really what's the opportunity um, that you are here on this webinar for? Uh, to be really frank that, you know, most people on this webinar won't get the fellowship. Uh, 1,200 people applied last year for eight slots. We anticipate more will. But I will tell you that uh, I applied for uh, an OSI fellowship back in 2006. I was declined. Uh, the fellowship was to, uh, my proposal was to launch a newspaper for African American fathers uh, called Proud Papa. And I decided that you know, this was a passion and this was a calling that I was going to do it anyway uh, despite the decline in the fellowship. So uh, I am just encouraging folks not to um, apply just because there's this opportunity for resources, uh, that this is really a passion. And so I went ahead and launched the, the, the newspaper, and then uh, three years later, um, because of that newspaper, I was able to uh, land back here at the Campaign for Black Men Achievement. I think there's an opportunity to build social intellectual capital uh, for your projects. Um, how do we build community and connectivity? I encourage you all to investigate the Leadership and Sustainability Institute, which is a national membership and uh, uh, network, and to uh, join that, and Equin Green will uh, uh, share that uh, uh, information uh, uh, with you. And uh, the last thing I will say be, before passing it on to uh, Donnell is, uh, the fellows during the retreat uh, in August had an opportunity to uh, spend half a day at the Harlem Children's Zone. And um, they had a talk 
uh, or heard a talk by Jeff Canada, the CEO of uh, HCG, and one of the things he told the fellows was that uh, a few things he said. He said, well, you know, get yourself physically and spiritually fit if you really intend on building uh, something big and bold, and I pass on that uh, information. Uh, he also said, get really crystal clear on what success looks like, and as you are crafting your applications, focus uh, on that. Uh, and he really highlighted the importance of data and evaluation uh, for a tool of attractive stories, and using data and combining it with a compelling story on what you're trying to change uh, to craft a, a, a really compelling uh, uh, application. So I encourage you all to go to uh, the uh, website, uh, which is on the screen right now, to uh, learn more about the campaign for Black Male Achievement. And uh, I'm going to end there and uh, pass it on to uh, Donnell. Thanks, John. Um, so here with us today is uh, 2012 Black Male Achievement Fellow uh, Donnell Baird um, to speak about his experience applying for the fellowship and to answer some of your questions. Um, before founding Black Power, Donnell spent three years as a community organizer in Brooklyn. With Black Power, he aggregates groups of customers like Groupon, um, like the organization company Groupon, to negotiate energy savings, pricing discounts, and community hiring quotas with renewable energy efficiency firms. The mission of Block Power is to create jobs for black men and reduce costs for community organizations by leveraging community-led solar and weatherization retrofits for churches and nonprofits. So after reading that, um, I think my first question to Donnell is, really, how did you come up with the idea for your organization? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Decker. It, it, it came out of a, a need that we saw. Um, I was invited by you know colleagues to a church in Newark, New Jersey, and on stage there were 26 African American men and one African American woman out in Newark. They were all ex-offenders, um, but but they'd been given an opportunity under the stimulus to be trained uh, for green jobs to do weatherization work in New Jersey. And uh, the governor of New Jersey was there, and he handed them their diplomas and made a commitment to them that they would be employed. Um, and, and, you know, all of their family members, uh, their, their wives and girlfriends and sisters and daughters and sons were there in support of them, and everyone was just so proud that all of these folks had been given a second shot, um, you know, particularly, uh, you know, when you're an ex-offender uh, and an African-American, it can be difficult to really re-enter the workforce. And I, I just thought that, that was an incredible opportunity, and just having a chance to experience that um, saw an opportunity for us as African-Americans to really... Um, be employed in the energy efficiency in solar industries. Can you talk about how uh, the process of preparing your Black Male Achievement uh, application? Um, what did you find the most helpful? Um, what was your process um, once you knew you wanted to apply to submitting the application? So I'll, I'll tell you what I did, and it, it may sound a little abnormal. I, I Googled uh, Echoing Green and watched every single YouTube clip of every single Echoing Green fellow who made uh, their 90-second pitch uh, for their business, um, for their nonprofit. I Googled Cheryl Dorsey, the executive director, and Laura Galinsky, and w watched all of their videos that were on Google, and I read every article that they were mentioned in, every single one. Um, and then I actually sat down with an Echoing Green fellow that I was able to ask for a meeting and kind of asked for his advice. Um, so I found that there was no substitute for really thorough preparation. Um, and, you know, I think what came out of that is I, I was really able to understand Echoing Green and Open Society Foundations, you know, their organization, the kind of values that the organization have, the kind of culture and priorities um, that, they, that, that they have and, you know, what they're looking for in their fellows. And so there's no substitute for preparation. And I think to echo what Sean mentioned earlier about what Jeffrey Canada said to us, you, you got to be prepared to do the work, you know, physically and mentally. Yeah. Can you tell me uh, um, kind of how you've seen the partnership between Open Society Foundations and Echoing Green play out as a fellow? Um, how have you seen it from your vantage point? From my, from my vantage point, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I think we, we have heard stories that Sean and Rashid and Decker have shared with us about um, kind of how these two huge, enormously, incredibly powerful foundations were, were, were able to kind of come together and form this amazing partnership. Um, 
and being able to experience as a fellow just means you know li literally twice the resources, twice the mentor, twice the network, twice the relationship, um, and it's just it's just been amazing to to kind of have access to that, um, and 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 it's been quite seamless. Uh, you know, both organizations are different, but but in in this fellowship, they've really found. Um, something that both organizations are passionate about, and we feel really fortunate to to kind of to kind of be able to benefit from both foundations. Um, can you tell a little bit, go a little bit deeper, and tell me kind of what what does the support look like, um, both pers personally and professionally, um, per personally and organizationally um, as a fellow? What what does that support look like? What do what do the applicants look forward to, um, aspire to, if they become a fellow? There's a significant degree of training and technical assistance. Um, you know, there's there's legal or financial or accounting questions that you may have, and so the organizations kind of provide folks who can directly answer um, some of that for you. And so, you know, I, I found that I was able to save a bunch of money in lawyers' fees, for example, just by being able to talk with Decker and other folks in the Echoing Green and Open Society Network who were kind of able to answer my questions. So instead of having to pay a lawyer, I was able to talk to them. Um, and so the, just that, you know, kind of technical assistance piece um, has been incredibly helpful to me. But but the, the, just the opportunities for mentorship um, are, are are unbelievable. And you had a chance to hear Sean, and you can obviously see uh, how fortunate it would be to to have someone like him as a mentor. Um, but then but then even beyond that, there are so many people in the network of both foundations who who we have the opportunity to connect to and meet and talk to about about our vision and our organization um, and, 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 and when they're interested you can just develop uh, so many relationships with a wide range of people across both foundations. So, it, so I'd say that the kind of network and the technical assistance um, and kind of uh, development that, that we've experienced through that is the real, is the real value. I mean it's been, it's been unbelievable. I, I'm not sure that you can find it. Uh, there, there, there's nothing else of this kind that we can find. Um, uh, can you tell me about uh, the obstacles you faced? Um, so, what was the great? What are the, what are the greatest obstacles that you see facing African American social entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs that are that are focusing on U.S. domestic African American, specifically Black male issues? Um, and, and specifically, what obstacles have you you faced in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean I, I think I'd have two answers to that. So, so the first one's pretty obvious, and that's money, right? Capital, and I think that's you know that challenge is not going to be something that's unique to us. I think there's particular uh, particular challenges that come around fundraising for a nonprofit or for a social enterprise when you are in the black male achievement space. Um, I think I think that Sean has opened up opportunities, you know, for us, um, you know, on that front, right? But um, I think I think second for for, for me um, I I actually found it challenging and I don't know how many folks m might have this experience I I have always found it challenging to kind of be really direct and upfront and not ashamed about my commitment you know personally and organizationally to improving life outcomes for Black men um, I think when you talk to someone from India or someone from China you know they can be really clear and direct like hey I want to help people in rural India, or I want to help people in urban China, and I'm focused on that. Um, for, for me, I always felt like I, I couldn't be upfront about the fact that that that, that was my goal, um, and I, 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 I found that particularly challenging. So, so, so that piece, um, and, and, and then I think the money piece are two particular challenges um, in this space. And um and I want to see um uh, I have a question for Sean kind of in that same vein and it's almost the same question it is from your perspective Sean as you all are, are are rolling out this strategy and specifically launching the LSI I mean what are the obstacles that you face but then also what do you what are the solutions that you see to those obstacles Well I think that you know just the resistance and obstacle uh, is the question of why black men. Uh, why black boys? Why focus uh, on this strategy? Why not have a more broad, universal approach? Uh, and so, an obstacle is, you know, how do we galvanize uh, philanthropic and, and 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 public will? And I think one of the things that you know I've learned, uh, and I guess most people on this 
uh, webinar already know that you know resources in so many ways drive strategy and we are just so happy that the board and Mr. Soros decided that we would focus explicitly on black men and boys. And we partner, uh, it's not an either or, it's an and and both, and we partner with uh, initiatives and philanthropic efforts that who have the framework of men and boys of color, uh, males of, uh, of color. But it is really empowering to be able to lead a national philanthropic strategy that is unapologetically black male. So getting over a, 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 a that hurdle. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think cultivating uh, philanthropic partnerships has helped us. And so we are not the only game uh, 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 in this work. We're not the only foundation. There are a number of foundations, the Knight Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson, uh, uh, the California Endowment, uh, Skillman, and uh, a number of funders that have uh, uh, placed a stake in the ground uh, in this work. And so that has helped us too. It's not like we're the lone voice in the uh, uh, wilderness uh, talking about it and, and, and advocating for black men and boys. I think the power of convening uh, helps us to uh, uh, build momentum. I think taking an approach of combining and investing in direct service and policy advocacy that it is not an either or, it's a both. And I'll quote uh, John uh, uh, Jackson from the uh, Schott Foundation, who says that uh, programs are progress, which we need, but we also, but policy is power, and we like to combine uh, 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 both of those. And the last thing I would say, as far as overcoming barriers, I just think the significance of the recent launch of the Leadership and Sustainability. Institute is really serving as an engine for the field of black male achievement. And I would tell you, uh, Decker, four years ago, while well, this work has been going on for, you know, dare I say centuries, four years ago, um, we were not considering this a field. And over the last four years, we have been able to uh, uh, develop an emerging field. And I think the fellowship and the uh, uh, social entrepreneurial energy that Eckwin Green brings to the field, I think, has accelerate, accelerated this across the country. Uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, and now I'm going to turn it to my colleague, uh, Nate Matson, who is going to um, talk a little bit more about the application process um, and answer a couple of additional questions about the fellowships in general. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so we had a couple questions uh, come in just about the uh, mechanics of the fellowship and some eligibility stuff. So I want to try and blow through a few of those really quickly. Um, so one question was, um, how small is too small? Could the idea start off in one city or even just one zip code? Um, and the answer is, yeah, the uh, organizations can start very small. You know, some people come to us with an organization that hasn't even launched yet. It's just the idea for an organization. And it might be that um, you're initially focusing in really narrowly but really deeply um, with a small population of folks that you're going to be working with. And that's totally fine. Um, you know, like I said in the eligibility section earlier, we are looking for people who are have a vision for big, bold change. But you don't necessarily need to be starting at you know, a massive organization, focusing in on one city or one neighborhood, or even you know, a couple of blocks can be an incredibly powerful idea. Um, will a business plan be required? So um, there is no business plan required. We talked a little bit about earlier that um, we want to hear your thinking about staffing and budget and those sorts of things, but you don't need to have every single question figured out to uh, apply for the BMA fellowship. Uh, someone asked, is there an age limit for applicants? There's no age limit. Um, that's not one of our uh, selection criteria or one of our eligibility uh, requirements. Um, someone else asked, what if you haven't raised $10,000 for your project? Um, can you still apply and does that weaken your application? Um, you can apply if you haven't raised a single dollar yet. You're definitely still eligible to apply. Um, we are looking for, you know, 
great leaders with great ideas. We're not necessarily, necessarily looking for the organization that's done the most fundraising thus far or who, you know, has the biggest bank account balance. We're really focused in on those eight criteria. So don't worry if your organization's still very young and you don't have that proven history of raising a ton of money. That's all right. Um, how are the application sections weighted as part of the overall score? Um, there isn't a weighting section by section. Um, again, we're looking at those eight criteria. That's really what we're focusing in on. And uh, different parts of the application speak to those various criteria. So I just say when you're filling out the application, it's worth even having a list right next to you know where you're writing the application, where you're constantly looking back and saying, "Am I answering you know these eight questions? Am I showing these eight things that they're looking for?" Um, and then, if what should I do if I have a great idea but have not completed a budget? Um, if you haven't done a full-blown budget, that's totally fine. We ask a couple of questions about budget in the application, um, but you can sort of give us your best estimate of where you're at right now. How much do you think that this program would cost if fully implemented over you know the time periods that we're asking about? You don't need to have that totally dialed in and you know line by line budget or anything like that. Um, so we're just about running out of time, so I'll pass to Mary Beth to talk a little bit about next steps and timeline, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks, Nate. So uh, what should you do next? You can sign up for emails with more information on our application dates and deadlines. Um, you can also watch some short videos available on our application guidance page about eligibility and our evaluation criteria. Um, you should also start on the application essay questions early, and they've been, made, they've been made available on our application guidance page, uh, the link to which is on this slide. And, and the application help text is the greatest guide we have, um, a great resource for helping you prepare a strong application, so you should try and read it carefully. And of course, you should get ready to apply between December 4th and January 7th. So this is a timeline of our application process. You'll see that our phase one application opens on December 4th and closes on January 7th. Um, each application is given multiple reviews in this round to ensure a thorough review. About 75 applicants will be chosen to move on from phase one to phase two, and they will have from February to March to finish the second part of our application. Phase two is an expansion upon the short essays uh, from phase one and requires applicants to attach an extended budget, competitive analysis, and letters of recommendation. Each application is reviewed multiple times in this round as well. Approximately 20 applicants will be chosen from phase two to come to New York for our finalist weekend, all expenses paid. This consists of pitching and interviews, and from here we will choose the next class of BMA fellows. So that's all we have for you guys today. I wanted to thank Sean Dove and Donnell, ba Donnell Baird for being here with us. Um, and like I said, this webinar will be made available on our application guidance page. If you have any questions about the fellowship that weren't covered in today's presentation, um, please visit our FAQ page on our website or email me at marybeth at echoinggreen.org. Thanks and best of luck. <laughs>